I think one of the most important questions that was asked, has been asked us is, Tom Skinner, why have you come to Chicago? What have you people got to say that's any different from anybody else who has been saying anything? There has been a lot of rhetoric in the world. People have been making a lot of speeches and a lot of noise about the issues and about the problems of the world. Why do you think that you people have anything different to say from anyone else? There are others who say, well, you know, the church, religion, Bible, all that seems a, a lot of phoniness to me. It hasn't worked. It hasn't put, solved any problems. Others say there are a lot of hypocrites who claim to be Christians. Others say there are a lot of you preachers who don't really mean business, who are really not sincere. Why should we listen to you more than any other person that we've ever heard amidst all the issues of our time? Why is it necessary that you people have to talk about Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Who is God? Who is the Bible that we should listen in this hour when there is so much conflict and revolution and hate and bigotry, so much disturbance, war, when there is poverty and hunger, what has God got to say that's any different from anybody else? Who are you people and who is Jesus Christ that we should listen to you talk about it? There are others who say, why do we have the problems we have? Why are families divided? Why are our newspapers filled with all the acts of brutality and hate? Why is there disturbance? Why does our country seem to be going backward instead of forward in terms of human relations? Why is there war? Why can't people learn to live together? What is the sickness that has infested the human race? Why are we in the middle of the problems we face today? And to understand it clearly, to see why we are faced with the issues that we are faced with today, we must go back to the very beginning. We must go back to those early chapters of Genesis where the Bible makes a very emphatic statement. It says, And God said, Let us make man after our own image and in our own likeness. That's where it all started. Now by the image of God, it did not mean that man looked like God or that man was a perfect replica of God. But the Bible says that God took this man, formed him out of the dust of the earth, and then breathed into him the breath of life, and the Bible says man became a living soul. And it was the purpose, it was the purpose of the invisible God to make himself visible in a man. Now that's still God's purpose. It is God's purpose to take you just the way you are. And as you are willing to submit yourself to his authority and let him do his thing in you and let him run your life, it is the purpose of the invisible God to take you and put you on open display in a hostile, mixed up, confused world as a living testimony that it is possible for the invisible God to make himself visible in a man. And that's what it's all about. Now, the Bible says that God took this perfect man that he made and he put him in a beautiful paradise that the scripture calls the garden. And the Bible left this man with some very simple instructions. He said, of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat. Now trees represent life. And what God was saying is that I want you to live. I want life to be exciting and thrilling and adventurous. I want you to live life to the hilt. I want you to go out under my direction and enjoy life. Let life be adventurous, exciting and thrilling. Of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat. But the Bible says that there were two basic trees in that garden. One was called the tree of life, and the other one was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And both of them represented two ways of life. The tree of life represented God himself. And God was in essence saying that if you eat of me, and the word eat means to depend upon, God was saying, if you depend upon me, you allow me to be your life, you allow me to be the pivot of your existence, you allow me to be the ground of your being, you allow me to live my life through you, allow me to do my thing in you, you will live. Life will be exciting. Life will be thrilling. You will come alive. And all that life can be, you will have it because I'm alive in you. And all man had to do, in essence, was to decide to live his life in dependence, in total dependence upon the God who made him. But there was another tree in that garden. It was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was the very antithesis of the tree of life. 
It represented independence. If man would have eaten of that tree, he would have in essence been clenching his fist in the face of God and telling God to get off his back. He would have said, I will be the captain of my own soul, the master of my own fate. I will do my own thing. I will run my own life. Nobody, including God, will tell me what to do. Now those were the two ways of life he faced. Whether he would let God live in him, or whether he would live his own life, whether he would live his life dependent upon the God who made him, or whether he would live his life independent from the God who made him. And that is the essence, that in essence is the difference between righteousness and sin. Righteousness is letting God do his thing in you, and sin is you doing your own thing. That's the only difference. All the other things are merely symptoms, you know, the lying, the cheating, the gambling, the murder, the hate, the immorality, those are just the byproducts. The real issue, the real issue is whether you are going to let God do his thing in you or whether you're going to do your thing. Whether you're going to live your life in total dependency upon the God who made you or whether you're going to live your life independent by telling God to get off while you run your own life. That is the difference between righteousness and sin. Now the Bible says very simply, God says the day you decide to do your own thing, the day you decide to eat of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you decide to become independent from me, the day you decide to run your life, be the captain of your own soul, and be the master of your own fate, that is the day you will surely die. Now there's some people who say, now that, that's the problem that hangs me up about you Christians. You're always condemning people to hell, You're trying to scare people. Well, God wasn't condemning anybody. God was simply saying, look, I'm life. I'm life. I'm it. If you want to live, get plugged into me. Let me do my thing in you. If you don't want to live, do your own thing. I'm giving you a choice. I'm not condemning you. I'm telling you where's that. That's what God in essence is saying. In the third chapter of Genesis, the Bible says that Satan that spiritual force in the universe who is diametrically opposed to the program of God came to talk to the first man, the first woman, about that tree. And he starts off like this. He said, hasn't God said that you cannot eat of every tree in the garden? Now God never said that. And it has always been the trick of this very powerful personality called Satan to take God's word, to take what God says and turn it back to front. God said, of all the trees in the garden you may freely eat, I want you to go out and enjoy life. I want you to live life to the hill. All God ever said was that whatever you do, do it plugged into me. Don't do it apart from me. But I want you to enjoy life. And one of the greatest lies being perpetrated today is that if you get plugged into God, you can't enjoy yourself. One of the biggest, greatest lies being perpetrated today is that to become a Christian, to commit yourself to the life of God and to let Him do His thing in you, will turn you into a bore. That you will end up being bored to death. Life won't be exciting and life won't be thrilling. That's why the skeptical people always turn around and ask Christians, well, what do you do for pleasure? As if, you know, we sit around and twiddle our thumbs all day. But what God was saying is you don't begin to live. Life doesn't begin to be exciting and thrilling and adventurous until you get plugged into Him. Well, Eve says, no, we can eat of every tree in the garden. We can't touch the one that's in the middle, lest we die. Now, God never said, lest you die. See, the word lest means maybe so, maybe not. Maybe God's telling the truth. Maybe God's lying. God said, the day you decide to become independent, you will surely die. No maybe about it. You will die. The scripture says, the soul that sinneth, it will die. And the word sin simply means to be independent from God. Don't think about sin as going out doing bad things. Those are only the symptoms. And by stopping people from doing bad things, you're not getting rid of their sin. You hear a lot of people say, we've got to go out and stop people from taking drugs. That's not the problem. Other people say, we've got to stop people from drinking. That's not the problem. We gotta stop people from committing adultery. That's not the problem. We gotta stop people from stealing. That's not the problem. Those are only the symptoms. And simply by getting rid of the symptoms doesn't get rid of the disease. It, it's the same foolish thinking if you think by blowing a person's nose you get rid of his cold. The issue is his cold. It's not his, his nose is running because he's got a cold. If you want to stop his nose from running, get rid of his cold.
We've got to get rid of disease that causes people to do those things. Eve says we can't touch that tree lest we die. And Satan only took one word, a lie, and added it to the truth. He said, you shall not surely die. Because God does know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods. Small g-o-g-s. In other words, what he was basically saying was this. Eve, right now, you are a very dumb woman. Every time I come to you and ask you about something, you give me this line that you've got to go and find out what the Lord has to say. I mean, has God got you so bottled up? Are you so dumb and so ignorant so you can't think for yourself that everything I ask you about, you've got to run and find out what the Lord says? Can't you stand on your own two feet and think for yourself? Can't you do anything without running to God all the time? Now, Eve, if you listen to me, I will liberate you. I will make it possible for you to think for yourself. Be your own God. Be the captain of your own soul. You see, the reason that God doesn't want you to eat of that tree is because God knows that when you do, your eyes will be opened and you will become as smart as God. And God is afraid of the competition. God doesn't want you to compete with Him in the Department of Wisdom. God's afraid that you will break loose and begin to think for yourself. You'll be able to add up two and two and get four without consulting God. And God doesn't want you to think for yourself. God wants to keep you bottled up. Now, Eve, if you just listen to me, I'll set you free. Because after all, look, you have been created in the image of God. It says so, right in the scriptures, God created you in his own image. Therefore, you have got enough God in you to be like God without God. What do you need God for? Think for yourself. And the Bible says that the first woman and the first man looked at that, that whole idea that they could be their own God. That they could be the captain of their own soul, the master of their own faith. They could run their own lives. And the Bible says they took of that tree. They became their own gods. They, they clenched their fists in the face of God and told God to leave them alone. They in essence said, God, we appreciate the fact you have made us. You put us in this beautiful world. We're excited about this exciting world you've given us. But from here on in, we can take it on our own. We'll do it ourselves. Now what happened? Three things happened. The first thing that happened was that when man decided to become his own God, when he sinned, simply by telling God to get off his back and leave him alone. And keep in mind that that is what sin is. Stop getting hung up on the peripheral issues. You may be the most moral person in the world. You may go to church every Sunday. You may have been baptized. You may sing on the choir in your church. You may be a deacon, an usher. You may believe God's up there. You may be the Bible every day. You may be the epitome of what a good moral person ought to be. But if you are running your own life, doing your own thing, making your own plans, and living your life independent from the life of God, that makes you as much a sinner as a harlot or a prostitute on the street. first thing that sin did was that sin separated man from God. Not too long after man sinned, the Bible says Cain rises up and slays his brother Abel. The Bible also says man became separated from himself, but more than that, man became separated from God. He lost one of the most priceless possessions that a man could ever have. He lost the ability to relate to God. He lost his personal knowledge of God. He no longer understood what it meant to have God in him and for him to be in God. It's like not having the plug in the socket. When a man detaches himself from the life of God, he no longer functions. He can't work the way God intended him to work. Because you see, it takes God to be a man. You can't be a complete man or a complete woman without the life of God. And the problem, the problem in our world today is that large numbers of people do not know God. Ask them. Stop, stop the average individual on the street. Do you know God? Well, I go to church every Sunday. No, I didn't ask you that. Do you know God? Well, I sing on the choir. No, no, no. You missed my point. Do you know God? Well, I'm a deacon. No, 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 no. Do you know God? Well, I can quote some Bible verses. No, no. 
Do you know God? I've been baptized. I've been confirmed. I take confession. No, you missed my point. Do you know God? You see, you see, being religious doesn't mean you know God. Everybody's religious. Everybody belongs to something. Everybody can get baptized. You can join most churches quicker than you can join the elves of the Masons. I mean, you can get in the church right quick. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about do you know God? And the, the sad situation that we face in our country today is we have produced a form of religion without a personal knowledge of who God is. And that most people are living their lives detached from the life of God. And that is the problem of our world today. Because men don't know God, the world's messed up. Because men don't know God, people are messed up. Because men don't know God, families are divided. Because men don't know God, we have war. Because men know, don't know God, we have hunger and poverty. Because men don't know God, we have racism and bigotry and hate. Because men don't know God. The second thing that sin did was sin separated man from his brother. Not too long after man sinned, Cain rises up and slays his brother Abel and then has the audacity to turn around and ask God, am I my brother's keeper? Because you see, when a man loses fellowship with God, he has no sense of responsibility to his brother. And that's precisely why, precisely why the world is messed up the way it is, that people can't get can't get along together. The number one issue that we face in American society today is whether we can pull off living together. The Kerner report says that we are two societies, separate and unequal, which was precisely why when I was a kid I had difficulty when I went to church singing songs like Onward Christian Soldiers and saluting the American flag because I didn't think it was really true. Said Onward Christian Soldiers, we are not divided, all one body we. And folk in my church were fighting all the time. There was no way they could talk about being one. They wanted me to get up and salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands. One nation. And I said, that's not true. We are not one nation. All you have to do is ask any one of the 500,000 Indians in this country, are we one nation? All you have to do is talk to 22 million black people. All you have to do is talk to a few hundred thousand Mexicans, talk to some Puerto Ricans, talk to some other groups that are being stepped on because of the institutionalized racism in America to understand we are not one. And we're not one because men are not plugged into God so that there is no way they can get plugged into each other. But it's not only a problem. It's not only a problem of man against, of race against race, religion against religion, culture against culture, but within the same race and the same culture, we got problems. Because you see, where I live, and you know where I live, I got three locks on my door and it's not Charlie I'm trying to keep out. So the problem is that you also have a problem internally. Men are separated from each other. And finally, sin separated man from himself. Man no longer understood why he was here, what life was all about. He became confused and frustrated. He lost his sense of identity. And if you look at the world today, you will discover, you will discover that we are facing a unique identity crisis. People are trying to find out who they are. They're trying to put their thing together. And if you listen very closely to the pop songs of our generation, listen to some of the pop music, listen to the words. And you will notice that all of them are speaking out of the same despair and frustration. Who can bring us together? Who can help me discover my, myself? Listen to words, whether you listen to Simon and Garfunkel, or whether you listen to Lou Rawls, or the Fifth Dimensions, or whether you're listening to the Mamas and the Papas, or whether you listen to the Rolling Stones. They're all saying the same thing. Who can help me out of my dilemma? What's the name of the game? What's it all about, Alfie? Who's going to help me put my thing together? They're all asking it. How am I going to get myself together? Who's going to help me figure out who I am? Now, they tried to offer some solutions. They said the way that man can solve his problem is through education. They said if we can produce a more informed society, that would solve our problem. If we can educate people and get people to be more informed, that'll bring people together. That'll plug them into God. That'll get rid of the immorality of our generation. 
They told us, secondly, that we could solve our problems through economics. If we could produce a more affluent society, give people more of the world's goods, give everybody enough to eat, enough money, enough, enough shelter, supply them with the material goods of life, and that would solve our problem. They looked at some of the neighborhoods that were exploding, and they said the reason that kid picks up a brick and throws it through the store window is because he doesn't have enough. If we could supply him with enough, that would change his whole outlook. But if that were true, if that were true, how do you justify going two miles south of the poor neighborhood to the nearest university campus? And there we run into this upper middle class kid whose old man owns the system. And he too is saying, let's burn it down. He goes in and he ties and gags the president of the school. He ransacks the school files. He burns the administration building, cuts the telephone lines does battle with bullets and guns with the police. When they arrest that kid, he's got carte blanche, American Express, and diner club cards in his pocket. He's got charge cards to the major department stores in town. He was driving his first T-Bird when the average poor kid was trying to get his first bicycle. And he too is saying, let's burn the system. He's got money. He's being educated. His old man owns the system. He can have anything he wants. What's his problem? And they're sort of passing each other on the road. Yes, sir. The rich kid saying to the poor kid, hey, kid, where you going? He said, well, man, I'm heading towards the system. You cats locked me out for 400 years, and I'm on my way to get a piece of the action, man. Well, let me tell you something, fella, says the rich kid. I just left the system. My old man owns it. <laughs> it's burning. Yeah. In other words, what he is saying is, here is the poor kid trying to get into the system, and here's the rich kid who was born in it who's leaving it. Because what the rich kid, now don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that, that the poor kid should go out and fight for, we've got to go out and fight for justice for poor people. But what I'm saying is that if all we're going to fight is simply to feed the hungry and feed their bellies, we're not going far enough. We've not only got to put bread in a man's belly, not only must we put a roof over his head, not only must we supply him with a job and dignity and opportunity, but we must also get him plugged in to where it's at. And where it's at is where God's at. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because you see, the affluent society has already proven to us that merely having economic security and having affluence is not enough. The world is being messed up by informed, wealthy people who don't know how to run the world. Economics is not enough. But the third issue they said was religion. If we can get people to be religious, that would solve the problem. Why well, give people religion? So we came up with religion. In fact, we made, we made America our religion. And we instituted a very Americanized kind of religious atmosphere. We made a slogan, God, country, mama, the girl back home, and apple pie. And we all became religious. But you see, religion is defined as that which a person feels to be of ultimate value and taking action in the light of it. So I could be a communist, a Buddhist, a Hindu, a Methodist, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, an agnostic, an atheist, and be religious. Because whatever is the most important thing to you, and whatever action you take in light of that importance, that's your religion. Your religion. So you can be religious without having anything to do with God. And that's yes, the problem in our country. Most people are religious. Yes, sir. You stop the average American, he can quote at least one Bible verse. Most Americans believe that there's a God somewhere. Forty percent of the American people go to church every Sunday. So we are religious, but how do you account for with all the religion, with all the church, and with all of the, the belief we have, we say, in God, why haven't we been able to come together? Why haven't we been able to plug people back into God? And so a search went on for man to find a way back to God, back to his brother, back to himself. And the search was futile. The scripture says that the heavens and the earth were searched for somebody in the universe that might be able to bring men and God together. It was Job. Old man Job, he lying on the ground with worms eating away at his body, 
He lost his family, his health, his wealth, his posterity. And he cries out. He cries out in the universe for a mediator, says Job. He says that there is somebody in the universe who can understand me as a man. Somebody that understands what it means to be weak and limited and tempted, who understands to be sinful flesh like I am, who understands the limitations of a man. Somebody in the universe who can grab me and all of my limitations and all of my sin and all of my degradation by one hand. And somebody in the universe who can reach out and grab hold of a holy God in the other and bring us together. And the Bible says, in the fullness of time, in the appointed economy of God, God decided to do something about the situation. And what God decided to do was God decided to become a man. You see, there was no man in the universe who could bring men back to God because the whole human race was infested with sin. Every person born into the human race was born independent from God. Every man born into the human race is born a sinner with this cancerous disease of sin in him. And there was nobody in the human race who could bring men back up to God. So God solved the problem by coming down to man. And so we read in John chapter 1 verse 1 these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now if, if it had stopped there, my reply would have been, so what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So what? But it's about a dozen verses later, it says, and the Word became flesh. God became a man. God put skin on him, and walked the earth as a man. And for the first time in the history of the human race, since Adam, another man has come to earth to try to bring men back to God. And the Bible calls Jesus Christ the last Adam. Now notice, the first Adam goofed. The first Adam clenched his fist in God's face and told God to leave him alone. The first Adam decided to be his own God and to run his own life. And now the last Adam, Jesus Christ, has come to earth to try to undo what the first Adam has done. And there were only two men in all of history who ever walked the face of the earth who had the ability to be what God wanted them to be. The first one was the first Adam. The first Adam said, I don't want to be what God wants. He sinned. And the whole human race became infested with sin. And now the last Adam, Jesus Christ, has come to earth to try to undo what the first Adam has done. And we've got to watch him very closely. We've got to check Jesus out. We've got to make sure that he isn't like any other man. Because if he acts like any other man, then he too is in trouble. As he walks the earth for the 33 and a half years that he lives, we've got to watch him to make sure he doesn't do. We've got to watch him to make sure he doesn't do anything wrong. We've got to watch him to make sure that he never acts independent of his father. And sure enough, if you keep your eyes on Christ, and if you watch him for the 33 and a half years he lived, he never did anything. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ never did anything. No, he never healed the sick. He never raised the dead. He never gave sight to the blind. He never performed any miracles. He never did a thing. He said, oh, wait a minute, Tom, hold it. That's heresy. Everybody knows Jesus Christ did something. No, absolutely not. Jesus Christ was the only man who ever walked the face of the earth who never did anything. His father did it. Now listen to what he says. He says, that which I do, my father does it in me. I do only those things which please my father. I have not come to do my will, but the will of my father who has sent me. He said to his own disciples, I don't want you to believe me just because you see me perform miracles. Don't believe me because you see me healing the sick, raising the dead giving sight to the blind. I don't want you to believe me just because I'm performing miracles. But I want you to believe me because the miracles I perform, my Father is doing it in me. And if you ever see me do something that my Father is not doing in me, then you don't have the right to believe me. But as long as I'm doing what my Father tells me to do, you better believe me. So you see, Jesus was told what to do and he did what he was told. 
And for all the 33 and a half years that he walked the face of the earth, he did only what his father told him to do, and he did only those things which his father did in him. He, for 33 and a half years, lived his life in total dependency upon his father. That was the difference between the last Adam and the first Adam. The first Adam says, I will do it myself. The last Adam says, I've come to do the will of my father. That's the difference. If you check out the temptation of Jesus, when Jesus Christ was being tempted in the wilderness, you will understand something of what he came to do. Satan said to him after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he hadn't eaten, he was hungry. He said, if you are the Son of God, why don't you command these stones be turned to bread? Now what in the world is sinful about making bread out of stones? Nothing. Then why would the devil ask him to do a ridiculous thing like make bread out of stones? Very simple. He was simply saying to Jesus Christ, you are the Son of God. You are God's Son. You yourself said you come from God. If you are the Son of God, you therefore have enough God in you to be like God without God. <laughs> so why don't you just turn those stones into bread but do it by yourself. Don't check it out with your father. <laughs> And if he could get Jesus to do one thing on his own, if he could get Jesus just once to act independent of his Father, then Jesus too would have sinned. But the, the exciting thing about Christ was that he never once made a move without his Father. Yes, and that's why he was perfect. And the Bible says that because he was perfect, because he was perfect, he was worthy to bear in his own body our sins. And so I heard one night, while mapping out strategy for a gang fight. I heard very simply that Jesus Christ, God's Son, came to earth for the purpose of bearing in his own body the sinful nature I was born with. But you see, I had a problem about Jesus Christ. Most of what I learned about Jesus Christ, I learned within a church setting. And Jesus Christ never came across relevant to my problem. You see, the block I lived on, there were 4,000 people in my block. 57% of them grew up without their fathers. Numerous drug addicts and all kinds of other situations. And you see, I said, if I'm going to trust the Savior, if I'm going to trust the Christ that's going to help me survive in this, he had better be tough. But the pictures that they offered me of Jesus, he didn't look tough. All the pictures they ever drew of Christ that I ever looked at books, he looked like a... Anglo-Saxon, middle-class, Protestant, Republican. He, he looked very soft, very effeminate. He had those nice soft hands as if they had just been washed in dove or something. And I said to myself, there is no way that I can commit myself to that kind of Jesus. He doesn't seem tough enough to survive in my neighborhood. How in all the world is he going to survive? I said, we could do him in on any street corner and we wouldn't have to wait until after dark. He just didn't have what it took. But I learned something new that night. I learned that the Christ which leaped out of the pages of the New Testament was nobody softy. I learned that the Christ which leaped out of the pages of the New Testament was a gutsy, contemporary, radical revolutionary with hair on his chest and dirt under his fingernails. I discovered that he was the kind of Jesus who knew where the nitty-gritty was. In fact, he went out and rubbed shoulders and lived in the nitty-gritty. I also discovered that he could tell the establishment off when they needed to be told. And I hear Jesus standing up in front of the religious establishment of his day. The people who ran the whole town. And listen to his words. You generation of vipers. Yes, you hypocrites. You yes, filthy graveyards. Yes, You're like dead men's bones. Does that sound soft to you? Or, or how do you think he really said it? You generation of vipers, you. <laughs> or the Christ who walked into the temple where they had desecrated the house of his father. And he knocked over the money counters and he knocked over the money changers and he drove the cattle out. A tough Jesus. Or how do you think he really did it? He walked in with his grip and said, get out of here, y'all. <laughs> now I suggest to you that Jesus Christ was tough. But beyond being tough, he was also compassionate. He was a Jesus who could look at a prostitute and tell her that her sins were forgiven. He was a Christ who could stand up and weep over a city. He was a Christ who went out and rubbed shoulders with people of ill repute, opened his arms to them, made himself available to them. Yeah. It's that kind of Christ. Yeah. 
My other problem was that that I couldn't buy Jesus Christ because, you see, I said the society is messed up. Anybody could prove the society was messed up. Then I said to myself, the church is in the society. And the church seems to reflect the values of the society, I said. So it makes sense that if the church is an institution, and all institutions in order to survive must survive in the society, then if the, the society is corrupt, then the church must be corrupt, I said. Then they told me that Jesus Christ was the head of the church, and I said there must be something wrong with him too. I had a problem. Until I discovered, until I discovered what the real church was like in the New Testament. Yes, that it wasn't like a lot of the churches I've been seeing. Yes, it wasn't like a lot of the foolishness I saw. Yes, it wasn't like a lot of the hypocrisy I saw. Yes, it wasn't like a lot of the people who were playing games with God. Yes, I read the Bible and I saw for the first time that Jesus Christ came not to call people necessarily to a church or an institution, but he came to call people to himself. Call people unto himself. And I was told that they took this Christ and that they nailed him to a cross. And that they didn't nail him to a cross just because he was a religious leader who was too radical for his time. But that on that cross, Jesus Christ was bearing in his own body my sinful nature. And I was told that when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross, that not only were the nails nailed through his hands and through his, his body, but they were also being nailed through my sinful nature, that, that God had literally taken Tom Skinner and put him up on that cross with Christ. And I was told that when Christ was crucified, Tom Skinner's sinful nature was crucified. I was told that on that cross, Jesus Christ shed his blood, and that that blood was shed in order to forgive me of all the sin I'd committed as a result of my independence. And I was told that three days later, Jesus Christ arose from the dead. And that he didn't get up out of the grave just to prove he had power over death. But that he arose from the dead so any person who would dare to commit their lives to him, he would come inside them and live his resurrected life in them. And when I heard that, I was mapping out strategy for a gang fight. I was in the middle of planning one of the largest street wars ever to take place in New York City. And I heard that Christ came to die in my place. I heard that Christ died to forgive me. That Christ rose again from the dead to live in me. And he was prepared to send me out into a real world, living his own life in me, making me a radically new person. He was prepared to turn me on to what God intended a man to be. I responded to that Christ. I found myself bowing my head next to my radio that night and praying a very simple prayer in which I said, Lord, I don't understand all of this. I don't dig you. I don't know what you're at, but I do know I need you. And based on that, I now give you the right to take over my life. If these things are true, I give you the right to come inside and live in me. Yes. Do you know what happened that night? I had no traumatic experience. I saw no blind flashes of light. I heard no thunder roar. No mountain caved in. I felt no tingling running up my spine. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took up residence in my life. And he's been living there ever since. My life has never been the same. And the most exciting part about it is that from that moment on, I have not had to make any effort to be a Christian. You see, there are large numbers of people who think being a Christian means you carry around in your inside pocket a bunch of rules and regulations. And you keep them close by. And they say, one, don't do this. Two, stay away from that. Three, don't touch that. Four, don't go with near that. Don't look at that. And for God's sake, stay away from that. And you go out and you hold yourself real tight. And you try real hard to be Christian. And you look real sanctimonious. You ever meet those people who go around looking real holy? And you ask them, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with me. Don't you see I'm being Christian? And they go out breaking their necks trying to be Christian. And all of a sudden they feel themselves about ready to reach out for something and they grab themselves. And they hold on. And they say, wait a minute now, don't touch that. I've got to check the rules. Stay there, will you? Now, rule number three says I can't touch it. And they fight with themselves. And they battle and they fight. And some of the most neurotic people I know are religious people trying to be Christian. Because you see, my friend, you can't be a Christian. It's impossible. If you could be a Christian, there'd be no need for Jesus Christ. But the word Christian means exactly the way it's spelled. Capital C-H-R-I-S-T, Christ, I-A-N. Christ in you, living his own life through you, without any help or assistance from you. 
because Jesus Christ doesn't need your help in order to be Jesus Christ. You see, there are a whole lot of people going out trying to help God. God doesn't need your help. He made heaven and earth without you. God became a man without you. Christ died in your place and rose again from the dead without you. He ascended back to heaven without your assistance. Now what makes you think he now needs your help to run your life? He doesn't. All he needs from you... All he needs from you is your availability. As you commit yourself to him, he will come inside and live his life through you. But the exciting part about the good news is that Jesus Christ can be himself in you. And that's what it's all about. Instead of you going out breaking your neck trying to be a Christian, all Christ says is, look, why don't you just invite me to live in you? And I will come inside and be a Christian in you. I will live my own life through you. I will be your righteousness. I will be your holiness. I will produce the love, the peace, the patience. All you have to do is just be available. May I ask you a question? Would you like that to happen to you right now? As a result of inviting Christ in my life, I know who I am now. I know who I am. I'm God's son. I'm a member of the royal family of God, which puts me in the best family stock there is in all the world. I know who I am. Number two, I've discovered that Jesus Christ is, is not an American any more than he's a Russian. He's not a Democrat any more than he's a Republican. He's not a capitalist any more than he's a communist. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. And he expects me to respond to him as Lord. The other beautiful thing I've discovered is I haven't had to give up my blackness in order to be a Christian. I was worried about that. I thought I had to become a hunky to be a Christian, but I don't. I've discovered that Jesus Christ now lives his life through my redeemed blackness. That he lives his life in me and I haven't had to give up my blackness to be a Christian. Any more than Jesus Christ wants you to give up your culture. Any more than he wants you to give up anything. But all he does ask is that you give up yourself. And as you make yourself available to him, he will live his life through you. It's exciting. I know what my responsibility to people is. All I ask is that people give me the opportunity to love them. Whether they love me back or not is unimportant. I derive enough love for my relationship with Jesus Christ to be able to survive without their love. But I do ask that they give me the privilege to love them. Now, that, that doesn't mean softness now. That doesn't mean I let people walk over me. Because the person who walks over me is not only dehumanizing me, he's dehumanizing himself. And I love him too much to let him dehumanize himself so I won't let him walk over me. But I do ask, but I do ask that he give me the privilege to love him. And he's provided for me the power to do it. His resurrected life is now living in me. I stand here tonight as a complete new person. Jesus Christ has completely transformed my life. I argue with, it, argue with you that if he could do it for me, he has to be able to do it for you. The question is, do you want him to?
I'm convinced that when historians come to document our time, that is when they must find some kind of label to put on our generation, to say something about this, this age, this, this time. Historians are going to be forced to call this the age of revolution simply because there have been more revolts and more changes in our time period than any similar period like it in all the history of men. There have been economic changes, there have been social changes, there have been political changes, there have been changes in the lifestyle of people, there have been changes in fashions, changes in attitudes, and I'm convinced that our time, more than any other period in human history, will definitely have to be a time of revolution. But there are those people who say, okay, it's a time of revolution, it's a time of change. But what are the answers? Are there any solutions to, to the conflict of our time? Will, will revolution ever end? Will we ever come up with a society the way it ought to be? The interesting thing is that the majority of the revolutions of our time, the majority of the revolutions in the last 100 years, have always been incurred by a small group of people, never the majority. Most good changes, most relevant changes, have never occurred by a great number of people. It has always occurred by a small group of people who looked at an existing situation, decided the system needed to be changed, and against overwhelming odds went out to change it. Someone has said, 10% of the people are actively engaged in progressive change. 10% of the people are actively engaged in resisting change, and the other 80% just sit there. Someone else has said there are the few people who make things happen, the many people who watch things happen, and the overwhelming majority of the people who have no idea what has happened. And the problem is that in our society, in the age and generation in which we live, the overwhelming majority of the people in America today have absolutely no idea what is happening. And that most of the changes in the world are being brought about by a small group of people. Right or wrong, it is a handful of people who are basically saying there needs to be revolution. If you go back, you will also discover that the majority of the changes are being brought about by young people. We are, be we are told that the average age in the United States is something like 24. The majority of the people alive in our country right now born, were born since 1945, which clearly puts young people in the majority. And basically, young people are saying the system has got to be changed, the world has got to be changed, and many young people are committed that they will not leave the world the way they found it. It's an age of revolution. If you go back approximately 120 years, we can trace many revolutions that have occurred since then. In fact, it was 1948. A young German sat down in a dinky room in Germany and decided that the world needed to be politically and economically changed. He took his thoughts and he put it down on paper and he had them printed into pamphlets and he entitled them Das Kapitel. And he spread them throughout Europe Handfuls of people began to read those writings and those pamphlets. Most people ignored them. Just a few people around the world thought they were good and thought the ideas could work. It was 60 years later, 60 years later, in a rundown place in Russia, a young Russian sat down and read those writings and decided that they could work. He began to go out throughout Russia trying to sell people on these new political economic ideas. Again, only handfuls of people believed in them. And one day this young Russian stood up in the middle of a town square and spoke to a large group of people about the need to bring about revolutionary change in his country. At the end of his very fiery and impassionate speech, he said to all those people standing there, those of you who are ready to die for the cause of the revolution in Russia, those of you who are prepared to give your lives that a revolution might take place, he says, I call you to step out of the crowd and join the revolution. The fantastic number of 17 people stepped forward. 
Not enough people to turn the inside of a garbage pail. But those 17 people went out and increased. And before long, they became 17,000 people. And then they became 40,000 people. And by 1921, Lenin had complete control of Russia. And today, communism controls more than two-fifths of the world's population. Why? Because one man had an idea, had the guts to stick by it, and he created a revolution. Somewhere in the same time, a group of brothers were fooling around in their backyard with a funny-looking machine that they said was actually going to take off the ground and fly. They called it a flying machine. And when the word began to spread that these, these young guys were building this thing, people began to say those young whippersnappers are fooling around with things that they don't understand. If God intended man to fly, he would have given them wings, they said. Sure, even in churches, people got up and denounced these young men who were going to dare to take off into outer space and fly through the air. But those young men had the guts to ignore the opposition, ignore the criticism. They got that crate off the ground, and today we jet around the world at 700 miles an hour. By 1973, they will be building these supersonic jets that will travel at 1,800 miles an hour, so that you'll be able to fly from Chicago to Los Angeles in one hour and 45 minutes. Why? Because somebody had an idea, had the guts to stick by it, and he created a revolution. It was in the early part of the 1930s. Germany had just come out of World War I. They had been defeated. They were the laughing stock of the world. Their military was in disarray. Their political system was all goofed up. There was all kinds of disobedience and conflict and lawlessness in the streets. And a young German arose in his country and he said to his people, if I am elected, I will restore Germany to a place of prominence. Germany had a war debt that amounted to several billions of dollars. He said, if I'm elected, I will settle the billions of dollars that we owe the rest of the world. We just won't pay it. He said, I will build a military that will be undefeated by the nations of the world. I will produce a young people's army that will be revered by the nations of the world. I will produce a super race of men in Germany that will be untouched by the races of men. 1932, he was elected. 1936, he had complete control of his country. By 1941, Adolf Hitler had plunged the entire world into war. Why? Because one man had an idea, had the guts to stick by it, and he created a revolution. It was in 1959. A young Latin American, along with his brothers, took a look at his country and decided that the nation needed to be changed. So he and his brothers went around from one village in Hamlet after another, convincing other young men and women that they needed to join the revolution. And then through a process known as guerrilla warfare, they began to attack some hamlets and villages and began to conquer them. And all along the way, they picked up idealistic young people who left their homes and their jobs and their parents and their schools and went off to join the revolution. And then one day these young people announced that they were going to march on the capital of their nation and take over the whole country. Word came out of Moscow and Paris and London. Word came out of Washington that these young whippersnappers would never make it. They don't understand international diplomacy. They're not schooled in the economic, political philosophies of the world. They do not understand the ins and outs of political ramifications. They will never make it. Well, Fidel Castro and his brothers marched into Havana, and they've been sitting there ever since. Because one guy had an idea, had the guts to stick by it, and he created a revolution. It was on December 18, 1960, four black guys sat down at a, lunch, sat down at a lounge in A&T College in Greensboro, North Carolina, to chew the fat as they did most afternoons. One of the fellows said to the other one, he said, you know, I think I'm going into town to eat my dinner instead of eating in the school cafeteria. One of the other fellows said, where do you plan to eat? He said, well, they've just built this new restaurant down on Main Street, and I'm going down there to check out the food. One of the other guys said, well, what you mean is that you're going in the black door, in the back door, and you're going to have them serve you through the back window, and then you're going to bring the food back here because you know they don't serve colored people down there. Well, he says, I'm not going down to ask them to serve me any colored people. 
I'm going to ask for some fried chicken, and I'm going to sit there until they serve me. And those four boys went down and sat at that lunch counter, and they started a wave of demonstrations across America that turned America upside down socially. Why? Because one fellow got an idea and had the guts to stick by it, and he created a revolution. Now, I am not here to discuss the right or wrong of those revolutions that I've enunciated, nor their methods. But I am here to tell you that you and I live in an hour of revolutionary change, and there is no doubt about it that revolution is coming one way or the other. But we live in an hour of revolution, an hour of change. And I'm simply saying that anyone who wants to survive in the world today, Anyone who wants to live with his head screwed on right, anybody who wants to live in terms of being relevant to the issues today has got to be revolutionary. Now, what's a revolution? A revolution is defined as taking an existing situation, which is proved to be unworkable, old-fashioned, archaic, impractical, out of date. You seek to tear it down and replace it with a system that works. Now, that's a revolution. To take an existing situation which has proved to be unworkable, old-fashioned, archaic, impractical, out of date. You try to tear it down and replace it with a new system. And most of the so-called revolutionaries who are running around the streets today are basically saying that that's what we need to do. Now, whether we agree with them or not is incidental. The issue is that a revolution wants to change things. Now, if you go back through history, you will discover that there have been some great revolutionaries. If you take a look at if you take a look at history, you will discover there have been people like Plato and Socrates who were revolutionaries in the philosophical world. You will check on military revolutionaries of Julius Caesar. There were political revolutionaries, Karl Marx, Lenin, Hitler, Mussolini. If you look in the social world, there have been social revolutionaries, be it a Martin Luther King a Malcolm X, a Bobby Seale. They're revolutionaries in the social sense. There have been economic revolutionaries. The world has been filled with men who have gone out and tried to change the system. There have been great figures that have bared down to the history of men. And of all the research that I've done historically, and of all the revolutions that I've ever read about, and of all the revolutionary leaders that I ever read about, I have become convinced of all the men that ever walked the face of the earth, of all the men who came to bring about true radical change, that Jesus Christ, God's Son, the man from heaven, was the greatest revolutionary that ever lived. You say, now wait a minute. You mean that Jesus Christ was a revolutionary? That's right. A revolution is to take an existing situation which has proved to be unworkable, archaic, impractical, out of date, and you seek to tear it down and replace it with a system that works. Now listen to a verse that's written in the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now listen to the revolutionary content of that verse. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The job of a revolution is to bring about a new order. Old things have passed away. The job of a revolution is to do away with that which is old. Behold, all things have become new. The job of a revolution is to replace the old system with a system that works. Now that is what makes Jesus Christ more radical than any of the so-called revolutionaries today. Keeping in mind that the word radical means root. It means a person who gets to the root of a problem. A person who gets down to the foundations to where the disease really is. What made Jesus Christ so radical? What made Jesus Christ radical was the fact that he was the only man who ever walked the face of the earth. He was the only man who ever lived, who lived his life in total dependency upon the Father who sent him. All other people who ever lived came to do their own thing. They came to run their own lives. They came to have their own ways. All other men who ever lived came basically to do what was best for them. 
So when you hear people say, well, I'm going out to do my own thing, what they really mean is I plan to run my own life, be the captain of my own soul, master my own fate. And the sin of the world is the fact that most people in the world are doing their own thing, running their own lives, having their own ways, becoming their own gods. Jesus Christ was the only man who ever walked the face of the earth who never had his own way, who never did what he wanted, that never did anything to please himself. Jesus Christ said this, that which I do, my Father does it in me. I come only to do those things which will please the Father. I've come to do the will of my Father who had sent me. And time and time again, you will notice that every move Jesus Christ made, he made in complete dependency upon the Father who sent him. So that every word Christ spoke, his Father from heaven spoke through him. Every deed he performed, his Father from heaven did it in him. Every action he ever took, it was the action of his Father. Christ was the only man who made himself totally available to the Father from heaven and walked the earth the way God wanted man to walk the earth. That's why Jesus Christ was radical. Now when he came to earth, he came to start a revolution. And every revolution has got to have people to join its army. Every revolution has got to have people in it. Every revolution has got to have people who will follow the revolutionary leader. Some time ago, I read a pamphlet written by an unknown author. He was a revolutionary. He did not believe in God. He did not believe in the scriptures. He wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ. He was a revolutionary in the sense, a revolutionist in the sense that he wanted to bring about violent change. And in his book, he said there are three basic ingredients that every revolutionist must have if he wants to change the world. Anybody who wants to be a true revolutionary has got to have at least three basic ingredients if he wants to be a revolutionary. I would like to share those ingredients with you tonight. And I would like to ask you that based on those ingredients, can you qualify to be a true revolutionist? I'm saying again, there is no way by which you can survive in the world, no way by which you can make a significant contribution to the world, no way by which you can help change a messed up system unless you're willing to become radical. Now here's what happens. This revolutionary said the first thing you've got to do in order to be a true revolutionary is that you must give up yourself for the cause of the revolution. You must give up yourself for the cause of the revolution. Listen to the words of Jesus Christ, the greatest revolutionary that ever lived. In the 16th chapter of Matthew and the 24th verse, Jesus says this, If any man will come after me, if any man would be my disciple, if any man would be my revolutionary, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let him deny himself. Now the word deny means to ignore. It means to disregard. It means to have nothing to do with. Now basically what Jesus is saying is this. You want to be my revolutionary, then I demand of you that you give up yourself, that you have nothing to do with yourself. If you want to follow me, you must give up yourself in order to be my disciple. Now why would Jesus ask you to give up yourself? Why would he ask you to ignore yourself? Is it because Jesus Christ was some sort of egotistical maniac, so caught up with himself that he wanted everybody else to be? Why was it that Jesus demands that if you're going to be his revolutionist, you're going to go out and help change the system in his name, you're going to become a part of a new order to bring about change, then why does he ask you to give up yourself? Jesus Christ knew that at the bottom of all the problems of humanity is man himself. The biggest problem we face in the world is people, ourselves. Many of the so-called radicals today make a sad mistake in thinking that the system happens to do with things. For instance, you hear people say, man, we got to get the system. We got to burn the system down. So they say, let's get General Motors. And so they all march down to a General Motors building and they throw five bombs in the building and they burn the building down and they walk away and they said, man, we got General Motors. You haven't touched General Motors. Because what's going to happen is, the next day, 27 men who make up the board of directors of General Motors are going to call a meeting, 
find a new location, buy new land, and make new plans to rebuild a new building. That's General Motors. Not the building, it's the people. So if you want to change General Motors, you've got to change the people. Now what Jesus is saying is that people are messed up. And because people are messed up, the system is messed up. People say, America is a racist society. I agree with you. But if America is a racist society, it's because people are racist. People say, America is an immoral society. That's true. But if America is an immoral society, it means people in it are immoral. So ultimately, if you want to change society, you've got to change people. And Jesus was saying, people are messed up. And what Jesus Christ is in essence saying is that there is no room in the kingdom of God for messed up people. Therefore, therefore, if you want to be my revolutionary, Jesus is saying you've got to get your thing together. That the kingdom of God is only for together people. And you can't come together until first you're willing to recognize that you need to give up yourself, that, that you are the problem, that the human race is the problem, and the human race is made up of people. Therefore, if any man would be my revolutionary, let him deny himself. If you check out the problems, you will discover that it boils down basically to people. And this is ultimately, ultimately what a vast number of young people in America are saying. Young people in America are saying that the people in the system are messed up and that somehow we have got to go out and change people. And perhaps for the first time in, in our generation, for the first time in the history of our country, there is rising on the scene a group of young people in America who are dedicated to a moral change. Now I'm not saying these young people are any more moral than their parents, that they're any more moral than the generation before them. But they are now challenging the American system that it takes more than a clean-shaven face. It takes more than having your hair cut down to the right length. It takes more than a Brooks Brothers suit. It takes more than a business shirt. It takes more than an external, proper exterior to produce morality. These young people are saying that America is immoral. And you can't cover up that morality with a proper look. These young people are saying the system needs to be changed, and you can only change it by changing people. Ultimately, that's what Christ is saying. Jesus says, you want to change the system, you've got to change people. And you can't change people until you begin with yourself. If you want to follow me, deny yourself. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. In the seventh chapter of Romans, Paul gives a, a classic example of the whole problem of the human race. The inability of people to do what they want to do. He says, the will to do is present with me. In my mind, I want to serve God. In my mind, I want to do the will of God. In my mind, I want to do what is right. But he says, how to do what is right is what I can't find. He says that every time I would do good, evil is present with me. And he cries out, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this dead? Now what he's basically saying is this. There's like a dead man on me. And every time I would lift myself above the common level to try to be what God wants me to be, there is something that drags me back down. What Jesus is saying is this, you don't have the power to do what you ought to do. Man in himself is incapable of carrying out his noble ambitions and noble ideas. Man is a sinner. Man is by nature born in sin. Man is born alienated from God. Man is independent from God. And by virtue of being independent from God, man doesn't have the power to be what God wants. So what Jesus is saying is, until you recognize you are helpless, until you recognize you are powerless, until you recognize you don't have what it takes to be what God wants and are prepared to give up yourself, there is no hope for changing the human race. You must give up yourself. Let a man therefore deny himself, take up his cross. Take up his cross. Now there are a lot of people who when they hear the word cross, they think of suffering. You know, right away they think of suffering. And most people, because they misinterpret the word cross, tend to think that because they are suffering, that automatically means that they are Christians. You know, you hear many people, you walk up to them and you say, my friend, 
Are you a Christian? Do you really know Jesus Christ? Is Christ living in you? Well, with all that I've been through, I must know somebody. You know, and then they give you this whole long bit about all the trials and tribulations they had and their ups and downs and all their suffering. And they'll tell you there was a time when I was sick and out on the bed and I prayed and so I must know God. Or they will tell you there was a time when I had a tough time getting a job and I prayed and I got it. Well, just because you had a tough time doesn't put God on your side. That doesn't mean you know God. Job says, and listen to what Job says, Job says, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. In other words, all you have to do in order to have trouble in your life is just be born. I mean, once you're born into the human race, you've had it. The cross was not a place of suffering. The cross was a place of death. Death. The cross was the place where Jesus Christ was crucified. The cross was the place where Jesus Christ was put to death. So what the Bible is really saying is this. If any man would be my revolutionary, let him give up himself, take up his cross, and die. You say die? Wait a minute. You mean I'm supposed to roll over in the grave and die? No, no. The word death means to be unresponsive. When I was in high school and college, I, I did some dramatics, and I did a lot of uh, play acting. And If you didn't go out on stage in the first or second scene, when those people who were in the first or second scene came backstage, you always asked them, what kind of audience do we have tonight? Are they dead or alive? Now what that meant was this. If you said something funny and they laughed, then the audience was alive. But if you went out and you could crack a joke all night long and nobody moved, they were dead. But whether, the point was whether the audience was responding or not and determined whether people were dead or alive. Now, the word dead, therefore, means to be respond, unresponsive. A dead person can't respond. You can stand over the grave of a dead person and curse him out. He won't curse you back because he's dead. He can't respond. Now, what the Bible means is this. That God wants people in his revolution who are dead to themselves, who are unresponsive to themselves, who don't respond to anything but God, who are dead to everything but only alive to him. That's what God's talking about. That's what it takes to belong to his revolution. Jesus Christ is simply saying, you want to be a member of my revolution, you want to join my revolutionary army, you want to go out and do my thing, then I demand of you that you, you give up yourself, take your attention off yourself, want nothing to do with yourself, that you be willing to die to your ambitions, your desires, your particular goals to become caught up with mine. That's all Jesus Christ is saying. There is no place in the kingdom of God for people who are caught up with themselves. The name of the game is to be caught up with Jesus Christ. That's where it's at. This revolutionary said the second thing that every true revolutionary has got to have is that he must love the cause of the revolution above every other love in his life. Be willing to love the cause of the revolution above any other love in his life. Jesus Christ is saying this. If you want to be my revolutionary, if you want me to run your life, if you want to belong to this new order, then I demand of you that you love me above every other love in your life. Listen to the way he puts it. In the 14th chapter of Luke, in the 26th verse, Jesus says, If any man would be, would be my disciple, if any man would come after me, if any man would be my revolutionist, and does not hate his mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, children, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now by that, Jesus did not mean that you are to hate your loved ones with a literal hatred. But what he did mean was this, that your love for him, your commitment to Jesus Christ, is to be so intense until all other loves in your life would seem like hatred by comparison. So if there is ever a showdown between what Jesus Christ wants out of your life and what your mom and dad wants, Jesus Christ says he comes first. If there's a showdown between what Jesus Christ wants and what your husband or wife wants, Jesus says he comes first. If there's a showdown between what Jesus Christ wants and what your sister or brother or what you want, Jesus Christ says he comes first. In other words, Christ says, I demand to have first place in your life. Now, now the problem, the problem also is this, as you heard in the scripture read this evening, 
Love for God also means working that thing out in love to people. There is no way by which a person can claim to be the disciple of Jesus Christ and not be in love with people. There is no way that a person can claim to be a revolutionary of Jesus Christ and not learn to care about the people around him and the sickness of our time. The sickness of our generation is that we have forgotten how to love. We no longer know how to be committed to each other. The very fact, the very fact that America is torn with racism and division and hatred, the very fact that our nation is turned upside down, the very fact that our cities are explosive and tense because we haven't learned how to come together is indicative of the fact that we don't understand how to love. The very fact that we, we use such hateful words, the very fact that words like, the wor words have to be hunted around, thrown around in intense hatred. We still use words to, to deride each other. And so we talk about the dirty Polacks. We talk about the nasty spits. We talk about them no good hunkies. We talk about the dirty niggers. We still use language in relationship to each other, which proves that we haven't learned yet how to be committed to each other. And what Jesus Christ is saying is simply this. There is no room in the kingdom of God, be the man Spanish, black, white, yellow, grizzly, or gray, for people who don't know how to love. You see, the issue of our time is that we haven't learned how to relate to each other. And it's not only a matter of race, it's a matter of people against people. White people don't know how to live with white people who are, who are on a different social level or different economic level. Black people don't know how to live with black people who think, whose thinking is different. If you go into many white communities, you have upper class, middle class, and lower class, and neither class has anything to do with each other. If you go to another community and they're separated on the basis of religion, or they're separated on the basis of politics. You go in the black community and you will find that the Uncle Toms don't want anything to do with the radicals, and the black bourgeois doesn't want to do anything with the, this group, and so we got the bourgeois, the radicals, and the Toms, and they're all classic. Nobody living together. Nobody loving. I go to one community and I discover that we are faced with these problems. So our problem is, is to come to learn what it means to be committed to each other. And the greatest crisis we face in America today is to whether we can bring people together, whether people will ever learn what it means to love. And love is not mushy, it's not emotional, it's a commitment. It fleshes itself out in action. Don't tell me. Don't tell me that you love me and you're not concerned about my welfare. Don't tell me that you love me and you're not committed to my safety. Don't tell me you love me and you're not committed to justice. Don't tell me that you love me and you're not committed to feeding the poor and the hungry. Don't tell me you love people and you're not committed to putting shelter over people's heads. Don't tell me that you love people and you're not committed to the welfare and the well-being of people around you. In other words, the Bible states clearly, how can you say that you love God, that you're committed to God whom you cannot see, and you cannot love your brother with whom you relate to every day? The issue is very simple. To be the disciple of Jesus Christ means to love Him. And if you're not prepared to love Him above every other love in your life, then you cannot be His revolutionary. Jesus Christ made the whole criteria for love based on the way we relate to each other. Jesus said to those people, depart from me. I don't know you. But they said, Lord, how come? He said, very simple. When I was hungry, you gave me no meat. When I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. In other words, he based the whole criteria of love to him based on the way we respond to each other. And the whole issue is simply this. There is no way by which you can say that you are the disciple of Jesus Christ if you're not committed to people. Now, you see, I know, I used to run around the streets of Harlem as a black revolutionary, so I thought. And I used to rap down to the brothers in the community, brothers, we gotta get together, man. We gotta get together and do our black thing. We gotta come together and unite against Charlie because he's the enemy. And we gotta come together. We gotta learn how to love each other. But funny thing, every guy's head I ever busted, you know who he was? Black. Every guy ever ran my blade into his body, you know who he was? Black. Every store I ever raided, you know who the guy was that owned it? Black. And yet I go around and say, we all got to get together. In other words, there is no way by which you can talk about getting together and loving each other until you become committed to each other. You look at the political situation. 
We stand up in America and we say, one nation under God, which is a lie, because we're not one nation. We are not together. And so we've got Democrats against Republicans. We've got blacks and whites at each other's throats. We've got Indians in the white society now in a class. We've got minority groups who are being locked out of the system. And then we all want to stand up and claim with integrity that we are one nation under God. We are not one nation. And the closest thing we come to being under God is we've got his name on our money, and that is all. We are divided. Finally, this revolutionary said every true revolutionary in order to be a revolutionary has got to forsake everything for the cause of the revolution. Jesus put it this way in Luke chapter 14, verse 20, verse 33. Jesus said, if any man would be my revolutionary and does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my revolutionary. If any man would come after me and does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Now that's one of the toughest verses in the scriptures because most people would like to wish it wasn't there. There are those people who say, well, God doesn't mean for us to give up everything, truly. We can, we can follow Christ and, and do his thing without giving up everything. They say what the Bible really means is we should be willing to. Let's check out that verse again and see if we can find the word willing. If any man would be my disciple and does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Now what that means is simply this. It doesn't mean that God expects you to go out, take the last shirt off your back, and live in abject poverty. It doesn't mean he plans for you to take everything you've got and dump it all away and live like a hermit. But what it does mean is this, that all that you are and all that you have is to be totally committed to all that Jesus is. So that Jesus Christ alone owns you and everything you own, lock, stock, and barrel. That he has the right to do with you and what you own as he pleases. That's the whole name of the game. You say, but Tom, that's fanaticism. I can't buy that kind of Christianity. I can't buy that kind of commitment where I've got to give up everything to follow God. That's fanatical. You people are abnormal. You're asking the impossible. But check it out. I have a friend of mine. He was 24 years of age, just graduated from Harvard Business School with a master's degree in business administration. He got a job in a company. He was making $24,000 a year to start, and they told him it wouldn't be too long because of his brilliant executive acumen that he would become a partner in the business. One day, he gets a, new, a letter from the local draft board telling him that he is being drafted into the United States Army. He picks up the letter and walks into his boss's office to inform his boss that he has got to quit the job because Uncle Sam has called him. As he heads towards the office, if I say to you, listen, if that guy goes in that office and tells his boss that he's quitting, he's out of his mind. He's a fanatic. And you say, no, Tom. Uncle Sam has called him. It's a matter of patriotism, obedience, and duty. He must answer the call. I say, call or no call. He's making $24,000 a year, $2,000 a month. You mean he's going to give up a $2,000 a month to go in the United States Army and make $100 a month? You're out of your mind. You say, no, Tom, he's got to do it. Uncle Sam is called. So he goes home, and he tells his family he's leaving to answer Uncle Sam's call. And as he walks out the door, his relatives, his children grab him by the pants leg and say, Daddy, don't go. They start crying. And I say to you, look, if that guy walks out the door and leaves his family like that, he's a fanatic, he's out of his mind, he's crazy. You say, no, Tom, he's got to leave his family. Uncle Sam has told him, it's a matter of obedience, he's got to go. He puts on a United States uniform, Army uniform. The moment he puts that uniform on, he renounces all rights to civilian life. Before, if he wanted to go downtown and go to a movie, he could do it. If he wanted to eat out, he could do it. If he wanted to go away on a vacation on a weekend, he could do it. Now he can't leave the base without a pass from his commanding officer. He can't go downtown anytime he feels like it. If his commanding officer says about face, he's got to turn about. If his commanding officer says forward march, he's got to march. Whatever his commanding officer says, he's got to do it. And I say to you, that dumb fanatic, he's given up all of his rights to let somebody else tell him what to do. You say, that's not fanaticism, Tom. That's obedience. That's duty. That's patriotism. Then they ship him off to Vietnam. 
And his commanding officer sends him out on a search and destroy mission in some rice paddy, and he is shot down, dead. And they send a telegram home to his wife and a check for ten thousand dollars, saying your 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 husband died in the line of duty. And I said that fanatic, he gave up his he gave up his job, he gave up his home, he gave up his civilian rights, and now he's given up his life to go out for what? You say, Tom, no, you've got it wrong. It's a matter of heroism. He died for the country. He gave his life for a cause. Then I turn around and say, well, that's exactly what I want to do for Jesus. And then you tell me I'm fanatic. not fanatic. The 12th chapter of Romans says this, I urge you that you present your life to Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, which is your normal service. That's not fanatic. You are not being normal. You're not being reasonable until you make that kind of commitment. And that's the whole name of the game. I'm simply saying this, Jesus Christ is where it's at. He is the only true radical that ever lived. He is the only true revolutionary alive. I'm suggesting to you that most other revolutionaries are hypocrites or at best they are unable to carry out their true revolution. They cannot change the system because changing the system means changing people. And there is only one man alive in the whole universe that can change another man. And that's Jesus Christ. The Bible says this, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm saying, he's where's that? He's the radical. He does the change. Systems are made up of people. You want a revolution? You want to see the world changed? Then you've got very simply to begin with yourself. How radical are you? That is in the sense, as Jesus Christ come in to live in you? That's the issue. So I'm asking you this, forget about what church you go to, forget about whether you've been baptized, forget about whether you've been religious. The issue is this, is Jesus Christ living in you? If the answer is no, then I'd like to offer you right now the opportunity to become his radical. I'd like to offer you the opportunity to become the revolutionary of Jesus Christ. I would offer you the opportunity to commit yourself to him. I'm saying that Jesus Christ is the only platform from which a true radical revolutionary program can be launched. He's where it's at. And I offer to you tonight the opportunity to trust him.